everyone, um, welcome back to another Union Chapel webinar. My name is Jay Richardson. I am the organ scholar, whoops, the organ scholar here at Union Chapel. Um, and thank you for joining us again for our fourth instalment. Uh, we're going to be talking today about verbal instruction based scores. Um, during this time, uh, the director of the organ uh, Union Chapel, um, Claire Singer and myself, are trying to share as many elements of the programme as we can online. So today's session is the last in the notation series, but if you've missed the last three sessions, you can watch them on our education playlist um, on the Union Chapel London YouTube channel. We'd like to thank Arts Council England, the PRS Foundation, the Brereton Fund and Spitfire Audio for all of their generous support of our organ programme. Um, we call our organ programme Mixture, and you can find out much more about that, uh, including organ lessons, our composition and performance masterclasses, our school workshops, our tours of the organ, um, and our organ recitals, and of course our annual experimental organ festival, uh, Organ Reframed. That's all at unionchapel.org.uk. Uh, but first, uh, before we start talking about verbal instruction scores, I thought I should explain a little bit about how the organ works. Um, I've been doing this at the start of every um, masterclass so far, um, and uh, we really want to encourage you to write for the organ. So um, as complicated as it looks, um, it's not that bad really. So I'm just going to walk you through how it works. So you can see down here we've got the pedals. This is known as the pedal board and that is the part that the organist plays with their feet. Uh, they play with the toe and the heel of each foot, so they've got four digits to work with. Um, up here are the manuals. We've got three of, he three of these at Union Chapel, and you'll sometimes see two or four or one or five. Um, three is a sort of medium number, and what that allows you to do is play different kinds of sounds on each keyboard. So if I were to pull out some of the stops over here, for example, these, these little button things are called stops. Um, and when you pull them out, they activate pipes uh, for the uh, keys that you're pressing. So if I were to pull out some of these stops, I might get some more sounds on this manual up here. And if I pulled out some of these stops, I would get some more sounds for the, the choir, which is the manual down here. Um, so you can have different sounds sort of pre-programmed on each manual and that's why we've got so many different keyboards. Um, I know it seems like overkill but uh, they're all there for a reason and the, obviously the more manuals you have the more different presets you can work with. Um, so we're going to be using the Spitfire uh, sample instrument a little bit later on um, and so we'll be able to hear uh, what the organ actually sounds like which is exciting. Um, but for now, let's turn to verbal scores. So um, just before we start, it's part of the nature of this week's webinar that when I talk about the pieces we're studying, I'll be essentially giving you the score because of the fact that it's all written down in words. Um, because of that, I I'm also going to be showing you um, some of the original pictures of the, um, the cards that the scores were originally written on, um, usually in the 60s or something. Um, I'm going to be showing you those hosted on the uh, Museum of Modern Art website. Um, but please, if you're interested in studying the piece, follow up the links, um, get in touch with MoMA, let them know how much you appreciate them hosting that on their website. And if you're interested in performing it, make sure that you buy a copy of the score and or get permission from the rights holders. Um, that's really important. This I'm, I'm showing you this for educational purposes, but there's plenty of uh, places you can sort of follow up um, and get more info on the scores I'm talking about. Um, the other thing to note before we start is that with scores of this nature, um, it is particularly easy to accidentally or deliberately ask people to do dangerous things. And um, you have an ethical and legal responsibility, whatever you're doing, to make sure that the, the score that you're writing doesn't place anybody in physical danger or contain hate speech, incitements to violence, any of that kind of thing. Um, in other words, you're bound by all of the codes of ethics and legal restrictions for writers of music and theatre and performance art of any other kind, because a piece that's notated verbally can be any and all of those things. Um, so just make sure you think through the ethical and the legal implications of what you're asking people to do in your verbal score, 
before you show it to anybody. That may seem a little bit strange to start with, but it'll make sense in a bit. Um, there are lots of words and, sorry, there are lots of names for using words as a score. Um, text scores, instruction scores, verbal scores, they all mean the same thing. Um, the best place that I have managed to find to um, look for examples of really good verbal scores is a book by John Laley and James Saunders called Word Events Perspectives on Verbal Notation. And that, I will show you the website of it, looks like this. Uh, it's on the Blueberry, uh, Bloomsbury website, but it's published by Continuum. Um, so if you uh, manage to get hold of a copy of this, either at a library or um, I notice it's 10 pounds off, isn't that nice? Um, if you manage to get hold of a copy of that somehow, um, or ask a friend um, who has it, that has got some really wonderful discussions of um, some really great text scores uh, that you can uh, have a look at. So, um, there aren't many links to performances this week um, because we, I mean, people don't often perform these verbal scores. A lot of the Fluxus pieces are sort of quite, I mean, the Fluxus movement was, was a sort of 60s and 70s thing. And um, yeah, it's, it's, getting, um, it's getting to a stage where people are more interested in this movement as a historical thing than as a performance practice. Although we'll talk about that a little bit later, as we'll see, um, there, is, there is still a lot of relevance to um, what people do with the techniques that were developed. But um, another reason is that uh, some of these scores are not uh, that easy to record performances of. Um, again, that'll make a little bit more sense once I show you some of our examples. Um, but don't, yeah, as I said, don't be fooled into thinking that everybody has abandoned this kind of work. Um, Fluxus has been very widely written about by musicologists because it was such a sort of watershed moment. Um, but its influence is still audible today um, composers like Jennifer Walsh, Angelica Negron, uh, Christian Marclay, Larry Goves, Olafur Eliasson, the list goes on. Um, granted, they're typically not writing verbal scores consisting of a single word, um, like George Brecht used to do, um, or even scores consisting only of text. But the techniques involved in being able to write a really good text score that communicates effectively are incredibly useful in all areas of um, music and theater and contemporary art generally. Uh, so um, as always, I have written up a list of questions um, that I'm going to address. And the first one is, what is the distinction between a piece of music written with a text score and just a piece of performance art? And the answer is, it's up to you um, as the composer and or creator. Um, one possible definition is that musical text scores um, include or Im imply producing at least some kind of sound, uh, whereas performance pieces don't necessarily. That boundary is quite fluid. Um, George Brecht's event scores from the early 1960s, for example, um, don't always necessarily have to have any sort of sonic outcome. Uh, there's a piece called Chair Event, which says, uh, on a white chair, a greater, a tape measure, alphabet, flag, black, and spectral colors. So if I were performing that piece, I would probably do a light show of some kind. I might not even necessarily include any sound. So um, that might be considered performance art. That's certainly how I would think of it. Brecht might have thought of it differently. Um, in the end, it's up to you to tell people how you think of your work. Um, and hopefully they'll ask you as well. Um, you can call it what you like, basically. But currently, I think in, in, the, in contemporary music at the moment, um, if you call it music, people expect sound to be involved somehow, either recording or um, sort of output. Um, it doesn't have to be complex sound. The only sound that some Fluxus pieces involve is turning a radio on and off and maybe changing stations. Um, but yeah, just bear in mind that there, there is a little bit of fluidity in the sort of genre categories. Um, so how do we make something complex and engaging just by describing it in words? This is the sort of starting point for worries when people are writing for text scores. Um, it might be difficult if you were only involving musicians in your piece, um, but the really great advantage of text scores is that you can recruit other sources of sound information. 
um, each with their own complexities. So one of my favourite pieces of this kind is Pauline Oliveros's environmental dialogue for the New Hampshire Festival Orchestra, and that recruits um, Lake Winnipausey, um, which is a lake in the States. Uh, it's about, um, I think it's about 20 kilometres across. It's quite big. Um, I might be out by a factor of 10 there, but it's a big lake and the performers of the orchestra distribute themselves over the lake in small boats and they listen for the sounds around them and then begin to reinforce those sounds with their instruments. So the instruction is very simple, um, but the sounds of the lake are potentially complex and interesting and that is where the engagement and the complexity of the piece comes from, is recruiting outside sources of sound or information. Um, another point here is that some of the pieces of verbal writing are so vague that I would argue they're actually starting points for other pieces, not necessarily, they don't have to be performed as pieces in their own right, um, in the conventional sense. So you can still make something really brilliant out of a really vague piece, but you might do that by transforming it into another piece. To take George Brecht's uh, famous or maybe infamous word event from 1961, um, which is what I accidentally showed you at the start, I think. Um, that is here, and it consists just of the word exit, um, which seems like a really simple instruction. This is on the MoMA website, by the way, um, and there's a link to it in the description. Um, so that seems like a really simple instruction, but you could take it as inspiration for, for example, uh, an ensemble piece which explores different ways of exiting the stage. Um, maybe you could have some people just hiding on stage and continuing to play. Uh, or you could have a, you could build a maze on stage and you could have the whole ensemble try to exit the maze um, from the inside to get out while playing a piece. Or you could maybe go to a train station and um, put performers sort of busking at different en exits and uh, see which exit attracts the most people at different times of day. Those are all interpretations of the instruction exit. Um, the extent to which they are performances of George Brecht's piece uh, is debatable, but um, the point I'm trying to make is that it's not necessarily a crime to write a really, really simple text score because it can really force people to use their imaginations and it can be the inspiration for something a lot more complex. Um, the other thing is sometimes um, when you're making your score extremely vague um, and you put in just a little, like more than one word, just a little bit of extra um, information, basically two pieces of information, um, you, you know, you're, if, if you're really economical about it, you can massively get people's imaginations going. I would say writing verbal scores is about stimulating people's imagination. Um, much more than it is about anything else. So, um, Lamont Young's Compositions 1960 are a wonderful place to start for um, verbal scores, and uh, the most well-known one is number seven, uh, and the score is also on the MoMA website, and it's here. Uh, it's an F sharp and a B, and underneath it says to be held for a long time. So, as an organist, um, that immediately sets me to thinking, what can I do to add shape and interest to that long time? Um, so, I thought I would uh, give you a little, um, whoops, a little demonstration using the Spitfire instrument that we've got here. Um, this is the Union Chapel organ. So, um, if I'm going to hold my B sharp and my F for a long time, there we are. Um, I might, for example, start with a really loud and obnoxious registration um, and then reduce it over time. Um, when I, I mean, when, pe when most people read a long time, they think, okay, I'm going to perform this piece for six hours. I'm not going to put you through that, but I'll, I'll give you a one minute version of it.
There you go. Um, there is a version of um, Lamont Young's composition 1960, number seven. Um, so, uh, yeah, you can really get a lot out of being very vague. It, it helps people to um, use their own mental faculties a little bit. Some people will get quite angry that you haven't given them much to go on. It really just depends who you're working with. So communicate with your performers um, as much as you can. Uh, another good question is, can I read literally anything as an instruction score? And the answer is, yes, you can if you want to. We talked about this a little bit in the graphic score webinar where um, I suggested that you could technically read anything you like as a graphic score, any everyday object. Um, but just with graphic scores, uh, just the same, a good instruction-based score is designed to translate into a convincing performance. So you need to think through the implications of what the uh, you know, found piece of text that you're going to use what does that what would a performance of that look like and um th those sort of that thinking might lead you to write down a little bit more contextual information about what you're using so do sort of process it yourself and um give it some thought as well don't just um don't just hand it to a performer because then you're giving them all the fun of um of working out what to do with it just wanted to mention that briefly um, how can you create the sound worlds that you usually make with staff notation, um, those, those sort of sonic textures, um, but using a text score instead? That seems like it would be difficult, right? Well, um, it doesn't have to be. You can keep elements of um, staff notation when you're using verbal scores. Just as we saw in the Lamont Young example, it would have been a lot more sort of clunky if he had written F sharp and B below it. Um, around middle C, you know that. Obviously, if it's more concise to use a little snippet of staff notation, then um, feel very free to do that. Um, you can also include uh, chord names, uh, or you can write out uh, rhythms phonetically. Um, you might even find that um, communicating with text is more concise than um, what you had to begin with in your staff notation score. Um, it varies, just uh, yeah, figure out what's most clear and concise. Um, but by all means, combine verbal scores um, with staff notation. And in fact, if you are writing with staff notation, you're using text already, right? You're probably giving it a title and tempo markings and expression markings and maybe some performance notes on the cover page. So studying the different techniques and approaches of people who have written text scores um, is a really great way to learn about how to write text on your staff score that achieves what you want it to. In this connection, I wanted to draw your attention to some of Yoko Ono's um, so-called event pieces from the early 1960s, um, which are written in a really poetic and beautiful way, but also give the performer lots to work with. They're really well constructed. So there's a piece from 1963 called Snow Piece, and the score begins with the line, think that snow is falling. So she set up the mood and the context and it's immediately evocative um, in that um, you're now thinking about snow falling, um, but not much else, so it's quite focused. Um, and it's really important to set up people's imaginations in that way. And the next, line, the next line is, think that snow is falling everywhere all the time. So now you're imagining, you're, sorry, your imagination is really going. Um, but if she just started with, think that snow is falling everywhere all the time, it would have been a little bit too much to take in all at once. Um, so those opening two lines are really uh, a sort of masterstroke of getting people's imaginations going. And then the next line is, when you talk with a person, think that snow is falling between you uh, and on the person. So, but, sorry, between you and on the person. So she's providing a specific context for the imaginary situation that she has set up. And for me, that's one of the hallmarks of a great text score is that after you've stated your sort of general principles of what's going on, i.e. it's snowing everywhere all the time, you start to go through the, you start sort of guide people through the implications of it. Um, in this case, the implication is that when you, whenever you talk to someone, there would be snow falling on them and between you and that person. Um, she might have added that when you're cooking, there would be snow falling into your cooking pot or that, you know, um, when you're um, on the phone, you have to wear a raincoat because otherwise your phone will get covered in snow. I don't know. Um, 
There are many examples that she could have given, and there could be many reasons why she chose that particular example of talking to someone. Um, maybe you only need to get people to think through one of the implications, but thinking through implications, sort of guiding the performer through that in that way can be really helpful. Um, as a parallel with staff notation, if you put cantabile, for example, um, on a line, think about what that means for the part that you're asking someone to play. Maybe it means that there shouldn't be any really strong accents at the start of notes, or maybe it doesn't, and um, you should indicate either way, probably. Um, or maybe it means that they should modulate the timbre of the note if it's a long note, as if they're changing vowel. Um, again, that would be a, a really useful extra piece of information to give to the performer. Um, anyway, finally, the last line in Yoko Ono's snow piece is stop conversing when you think the person is covered by snow. Um, obviously in your imagination. So there are some boundaries around it, is the, is the point about that. Um, there's some indication of when the piece is going to stop, which is, excuse me, is comforting to somebody reading it. Um, some good practices for writing text scores there. Um, you'll quite often not see any indication of when the piece is going to stop in a Fluxus score, um, but at least I, when I'm, when I'm performing verbal scores, I like to have some kind of indication of when, you know, am I going to be here for the next five weeks performing this piece, or has the composer actually thought through how long, um, you know, when they, when they want the piece to end. Sometimes they have deliberately thought through that and deliberately not specified when the piece is going to end, um, but in that case it's, it's quite nice to see, you know, the piece can be of any length, just so that you know that that has been thought through and you don't have to sort of go back and ask them. Um, Another point about combining techniques is that sometimes it's helpful to provide both a text score and a staff score, um, complete versions of both of the same piece. And that um, might enable to, the performers to see what you're getting at from two different perspectives. Um, it's basically like showing your working, sort of explaining the thought process that led you to write down what you did. Um, if I were to take one of my favorite organ pieces, uh, which is Keep in Touch from Nico Muni's Hudson Preludes. There's a link to that in the description of our first video, which is about writing for the organ. Um, it would probably go something like uh, this. In fact, I prepared an example earlier. Um, how about that? Uh, so um, you're, you're essentially sort of saying, uh, this is how I imagine uh, I would have written myself instructions for how to write this piece, if you like. Obviously, I didn't write that piece. This is just um, my interpretation of what somebody describing that piece might write. Um, but uh, to go through the structure of it, um, I'm starting with a piece of imagination, <clears throat> uh, and then I'm expanding that imagination a little bit, so I'm trying not to give everybody everything at once. Uh, then I'm drawing your attention further to some of the details of the imaginary situation. Um, then I'm telling you what to do with that imagination that you've got, um, adding some more sort of uh, adjectives there and um, spacing it out to, to sort of try and embody what I'm getting at visually. Bear in mind, uh, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but a verbal score, just like any kind of score, is a visual representation, so you do, it is helpful to think about how it's presented visually, um, just as in prose and poetry. Um, and then I am specifying when the piece is going to stop. Um, so uh, I'm not sure that Nico Mili would like that, in fact he would probably hate it. Um, in some senses it doesn't really matter. As a performer, um, I might do that for myself anyway, just so I know what sort of world I want to inhabit when I'm playing the piece. But as a composer, um, I might create multiple versions, multiple scores using different techniques, and only publish one of them, um, whichever one I think is clearest. Or I might publish all of them. Um, they're just ways of getting you to think through the world that your piece is going to inhabit um, in multiple different ways. Um, is it difficult to write text scores to be performed by large numbers of people? Um, you might think that that would get quite chaotic, and uh, it definitely can do. Um, but if you write with large numbers of people in mind, in other words, if you sit down and say, okay, I'm going to write a piece that can be performed by 100 or 200 people, um, there are some good ways of controlling the chaos. So, 
Um, Makoto Nomura wrote a really great piece called Shogi Composition. Um, it's a kind of game piece and each person, you, you get a group and you sit in a circle and each person writes down, well, the first person in the group writes down a musical phrase and they begin to play it. Um, and then they pass the paper on to the next person um, who writes down another phrase that goes well with the first person's phrase. And so now you've got two people each playing their respective musical phrases that hopefully go well together. And you keep going around in a circle in the same way uh, until you get back to the first person who stops what they're playing at that point to write down a new and different phrase. And then they start playing the new phrase and the process begins again and goes on and on and on. You might need a conductor um, if you have a group larger than like 20, but the piece will still sound perfectly coherent because he has specified that all of the phrases have to go well together and it's going to evolve over time and particularly if there's a definite pulse to the first person's phrase and everybody understands that pulse um, you could end up with something that sounds actually incredibly coherent like a very structured way of doing a group improvisation where everybody who um, joins in one by one is adding something new um, and as it goes on and on people will perhaps adjust what they're playing to the overall density of the texture that you've created so there are ways of um, designing really exciting text scores that can be played by a large number of people. And more importantly, um, and this is an advantage of graphic scores as well, if you want to write a piece for, you know, that can be played by 150 people in your community, that would probably be quite difficult with a style score. But with a verbal score, if you construct it well enough, um, it can really work. Um, so more advantages of, of tech scores. Um, and another great example of uh, game pieces is, uh, of course, John Zorn. Um, he's written quite a few of them. Some of them are based on sports. Um, some of them really aren't. The most famous one is a piece called Cobra. Uh, it's, uh, there are a lot of rules. Um, there's a central figure or a prompter at all times, which helps. Um, that's, you'll usually find that in these large scale um, game pieces. But there's also sort of guerrilla groups and there are musicians prompting the prompter using their hand signals. Um, it's about as complicated as Monopoly, I would say. Sometimes more complicated, depending on who's doing it. Um, so John Zorn's game pieces are well worth a look if you're interested in writing large scale, uh, well, any, any sort of game piece. Um, I won't go into them too much now because they're incredibly complicated. But there are actually quite a lot of performances of um, Cobra, it's, it's quite a well-performed work and it's been written about um, quite a lot. So uh, I believe actually John Zorn has made a recording or several recordings that you can uh, find commercially. Um, there isn't a published score, um, but there'll be plenty of places where you can find people talking about how it works. So um, we've been through sort of the basic introduction to text scores, um, but if you've never write, written a text score before, where do you start? Uh, well, um, plays and theatrical works are a really great place to start, assuming that you'd like to create a performance of some kind. Um, the Theatre of the Absurd, which was happening in the late 1950s, around the same time as Fluxus, um, of which Samuel Beckett is the most famous example, um, there, there are some really um, great uh, playwrights and um, writers of all kinds making pieces with convincing structures that you can um, sort of draw on their, their examples. Um, if you're interested in working with the sounds of words, um, a really great place to start is um, John Cage's 62 Mesostics re Merce Cunningham. Um, Mesostics is like a, a um, uh, ch he's changed it from acrostics, as it, acrostic poems where the first letter of each line or the first letter of each where it sometimes spells out something else, um, but he's made it mesostics because it's the middle letter of each line. Anyway, um, it's a really cool piece and I've linked it in the description. Um, Cage basically takes individual phonemes from Merce Cunningham's name and uh, from texts about choreography that Cunningham used in his work, and he constructs a sort of visual poem using different sizes and typefaces. It's actually a kind of uh, graphic score. Uh, and a verbal score, and a score that uses the sounds of words rather than trying to get people to make sounds 
using other means. Uh, so do go and check that out. It's very similar actually to Kathy Barbarian's Strip City, which we mentioned in the Graphic Score webinar uh, last week. Um, how can you make the most of your musical skill and knowledge if you're starting out working with text? Um, you know, are you giving away your expertise because of the fact that everybody can write text scores if they can uh, read and write? Well, um, no, you're not necessarily. As a musician, you are uniquely skilled in creating performances, right? So use the same principles and instincts that guide all of your performances and all of your scores when you're writing a text score. Um, also, where your text score does involve producing sound, obviously all of your musical training still applies to shaping that sound. Um, if you're making a text score in the sense of a written text which is itself to be performed, um, we've already uh, mentioned 62 Mesostics, um, Remus Cunningham, but um, that's, and that's a fairly short example. I mean, there are 62 of them, but they're each quite short. Um, if you look up John Cage's lectures, uh, there's one called Lecture on Something, and there's a Lecture on Nothing. I believe there's also a Lecture on the Weather. In fact, that's the one I've linked. Um, all of those are still constructed sonically, I would argue. And actually, if you read the way they're presented in um, Silence, which is the uh, anthology of lectures and writings by Cage um, that he produced, um, that's quite widely available. Um, you can probably find it in a library somewhere. Um, and so uh, all of those lectures are long form sound pieces in some way that are constructed really well from beginning to end and they have a sort of formal architecture. Um, so do go and if you're sort of lost for where to start, think about how to, thinking about how to construct lectures um, in a sonically interesting way is a really uh, cool place to start. Um, the next question is, where is a text score on the spectrum between a staff score with expressive markings in it and just a um, paragraph of text with maybe a few snippets of staff notation in it? Like, where is the boundary between text score and staff score? Um, well, I would call something a text score when it's wholly or mostly text and when most of the crucial information comes from text. Um, that still leaves a little bit of room for graphic notation or staff notation mixed in with your text score. I would still call something a text score if it had other things in it. Um, but apart from um, giving musicians something to grasp when they first come to your piece, including those other notation techniques um, also means that it's easy potentially for you when you're constructing the piece to imagine how it's going to sound if you're new to text scores. Um, having a little snippet of staff notation that you can say, okay, I know what that sounds like, that can be really helpful. So don't think that you have to exclusively use words, even though it is a verbal score. Um, that can be an interesting exercise in itself, and that's what most of the Fluxus artists did, but it's not necessary by any means. Um, just to finish off with a couple more points, I wanted to make uh, some remarks about giving structure to uh, text scores again. Um, a text score doesn't have to be written as a paragraph, so it can be a table, it can be a series of cards, um, it can be really any format that a graphic score can be in, uh, except that um, it, it will sort of, how you construct it will change who performs it and how it gets performed. Um, but apart from that, um, you, can, you can really structure it in creative and interesting ways, in the same way that you can distribute your graphic score onto, you know, write it on the walls or make a cake out of it. Um, you can really go wild with, with how you format your text score. Um, as an example, Dick Higgins, who um, was uh, active around the Fluxus period, wrote a piece called Intermedial Object Number 1. Um, Fluxus pieces are very often called something like Intermedial Object Number 1. Um, anyway, at the start of the piece it says, construct what matches the following description. And then he goes on to list several properties that he wants the object to have uh, from a scale of 1 to 10. Um, so in terms of size, if a horse is at 1 and an elephant is at 10, he wants the object to be at 6. And in terms of permanence, um, he says, if a cake is at 1 and joy is at 10, he wants the object to be at 2 and so on. There are nine of these properties that he lists, and obviously everybody who reads the score is going to come up with different objects. Uh, and then at the end of the piece, he gives his postal address, and he invites people to send him photographs and, and films of their objects. Um, 
who knows what he intends to do with them, but the piece is very well structured because it goes, here are the properties of the object, now go and find your object, now capture it, and now post it to me. Um, so that's one really interesting way of giving a bit of excitement and progression to a text score rather than it just being sort of play a G sharp, now play an F sharp, you know. Um, the kind of thing that I thought I was going to be doing when I first started writing verbal scores. Um, and the other thing is, even if you don't provide structure, a good performer will provide their own, just as they will provide their imagination. Um, or you can force them to with a bit of advanced thought. So um, a really ingenious example of this uh, from Compositions 1960, again by Lamont Young. Number 10 says, draw a straight line and follow it. And that's probably going to involve going over obstacles, um, unless you do it on a wall, in which case, you know, somebody might just go around and around a room. Um, but uh, if you draw a straight line on the floor and follow it and keep following it, the piece structures itself, because you're going to be going over things and maybe around things. And I mean, you wouldn't be going around things if you're supposed to be following a straight line. But if there's a really insurmountable object in the way, you might have to go around it. I don't know. Um, you know, uh, don't take any mad risks. This is what I was sort of talking about at the beginning with making sure that you're not placing anybody in danger by what you write. Anyway, we digress. Um, there are some written instructions that produce a piece that structures itself, is, is the point I was trying to make. Um, and finally, there's the issue of muscle memory and just default what musicians do. This is a problem in graphic scores as well. When you say that a performer may, um, for example, the piece may be of any length, well, you know, that might mean that, a, that a, somebody who's used to performing string quartets makes a 45 minute piece and uh, somebody who's used to doing three minute electronic um, snippets is going to make it three minutes and a jazz improviser is going to make it 20 minutes and, you know, just, people just default to what they're used to doing. Um, one simple answer to that is to not have them playing musical instruments. Uh, you can have them doing other activities that still produce sound. Um, so a classic example is George Brack's drip music. Um, I've got a picture of actually George Matunas performing this. There he is on his ladder with his little um, junk. So um, in this piece, uh, you arrange a source of dripping water and an empty vessel so that the water falls into the vessel. Um, and this is from 1963 um, in Dusseldorf, I think. Uh, where is it? Yeah, Dusseldorf. Uh, so um, I've seen performances of that where people go, at the, they pour it from the top of a ladder. Um, I've seen examples where um, somebody pours the water into the open mouth of somebody else. You know, um, people do use their imagination. But having said that, um, I've also seen lots of people performing it in very much the same way, um, where the amount of water they're performing is a single jug, usually. Um, the water is poured quite slowly. Um, often it's not poured but dripped, which kind of contradicts the name of the piece. So um, those defaults are what people are used to doing in their everyday lives, right? People aren't really used to standing there with a pipette and dripping things slowly. Um, they're used to pouring things from one receptacle into another, and it's going to be usually a jug because we all have jugs in our houses. Um, the defaults of what people are used to doing. So if you want to encourage people to go to ex interesting extremes, not dangerous ones, but interesting ones, um, try offering examples or suggestions of the extremes to which your piece could go. So if we wanted to add more detail to drip music, um, and obviously we don't necessarily, it's up to... Um, George Brecht as to how much information he wanted to include. But if we wanted to sort of recompose it, we could say a small or a large amount of water. And that would get people thinking about, oh, well, how much water am I actually going to use? Or from a large height or a small height? Uh, and then people would think, oh, maybe I could, you know, go to the top of my high-rise apartment and release a single droplet of water from my window. Or maybe I could arrange for everyone on the top three floors of my apartment building to released a single droplet from their window at the same time. Um, if you add the phrase um, using any mechanism necessary, you might uh, get somebody pouring from a jug onto the floor, but like with a little mini water wheel in the middle. You know, it, if you just draw people's attention to the fact that they have options 
on how they're going to uh, perform this, um, then you're more likely to get interesting results. So um, that is it. That is the end of our four webinars on alternative notation. I, I really hope you've enjoyed them as much if I, as I have enjoyed uh, researching and, and making them. Um, and thanks so much for joining. As we have come to the end of the series, um, we have a really exciting opportunity. So we're opening up a call for um, solo organ compositions, which use some of the techniques that we've covered across the series of webinars. Um, so that could be using staff notation or graphic scoring or text or a combination um, of any of them. Um, and a selection of these works are going to be performed by our organ students at the chapel when we reopen. So if you're interested in writing a piece, um, please email me at organscholar at unionchapel.org.uk and we'll send you an information pack on what to do. Um, this call is open to 14 to 16 year olds. Um, and if you're watching and you missed the last three sessions, but you want to take part in that call for scores, you can watch them all on our YouTube channel um, right now, and they will continue to stay up there, as will this one. Um, so that's it. Um, thank you again from Claire and myself and from all of Union Chapel for watching today, um, and we look forward to hearing from you. Um, and please do try to keep safe. Thank you very much.